we are thrilled to have each one of you with us today. We're going to start with you, Nick. Nick Denuzio, principal of Terra Inc. Nick brings more than two decades of strategic marketing, event coordination, product development, and public relations expertise to his position of co-principal at Terra Inc., a public relations special events and creative marketing firm with a presence in Miami, New York, and Los Angeles. Founded in 2001, Terra Inc. has serviced top tier national clients, including Cadillac, Gucci, Dior, Chanel, Soho House, Faina, Chavo, Brickle City Center, Rolex, SBU Portfolio, Proxima Spirits, Fashion Nova, La Mer, Aqua de Parma, Skin Laundry, The History Channel, Hard Rock Hotels, Design Miami, Art Miami, just to name a few. Welcome, Nick. Ah, thank you so much. Thank you. Next, we have Sissy Di Maria, president of Krups Di Maria Public Relations and CEO of Cultivate, one of the most respected and established independently owned public relations agencies with offices in Miami, New York. Sissy is also the founder of Worldwise PR Affiliates, a global network of independently owned public relations agencies in key locations throughout the world. A lifelong equestrian, Sissy co-founded Give Back for Special Equestrians in 2013, a nonprofit that provides therapeutic horseback riding scholarships for disabled children and veterans in Florida and New York. Welcome, and can, Sissy. Thanks. I could use a little of that therapeutic horseback riding myself right now <laughs> throughout this. Well, thank you for being with us and for your time. Mm -hmm. And last but not least, we have Lauren Nazo, president of the Nazo Group. Lauren studied international business, finance, marketing at American University, as well as the University of Miami. Shortly after graduating from University of Miami, she joined the Patton Group, a public relations events and marketing firm, where she eventually held the title of vice president and became the driving force of the company. During her nine-year tenure, Lauren served in numerous roles and acquired astute knowledge at targeting niche audiences, providing unmatched exposure for clients as she developed and executed specific campaigns using a variety of approaches. In 2015, Lauren steered the patent group transition that would lead to the founding of the Nazo Group. Since its opening, the firm has spearheaded several industry-specific public relations campaigns for top companies and a wide array of arenas, including retail, high-end, fashion, publishing, hospitality, corporate health and fitness, beauty, swimwear, jewelry, decor, luxury lifestyle brands, and more. Thank you so much, Lauren, for being with us today. Thank you for having me. So we have a great esteemed panel, great conversation. About <laughs> I'm going to turn it over to Violet Camacho, my colleague, because we're going to be moderating for us today. Hi, guys. I'm so excited to be with you today. I wanted to check in and, and ask you all the same question, but I will start with Lauren. How has business been for you since COVID-19? Business obviously has had its ups and downs. We specialize in PR, marketing, and events. So clearly our events business has come to a halt. We, we saw it starting to really slow down like the first week of March when in New York kind of started panicking. Um, and then we started troubleshooting in February, like right after Super Bowl. I, we, I saw this happening. I forecasted this. We cut back company spending. Um, we really started budgeting then. And some clients were preparing, some weren't. We were trying to educate them and convince them, like, let's start thinking about this. Let's start thinking about it. It's very important that we do so. So by the time Miami was quarantined, we already panicked out. So we were ready to hit the ground running. Um, and, you know, we are very, very, we work close with a lot of our clients. So we just don't do PR for them. We're really integrated into their companies. So whether it's their social media, their events, their marketing, their advertising, and the communications that we, that we pretty much handle, um, it was easy for us to jump in and kind of readjust the strategies and you know educate them on what not to do and what to do and so it's been pretty smooth to be honest with you and we've been really busy so that's great sissy well um you know we're a 30 year old agency so we have a lot of experience with the ups and downs of business cycles 
And um, the minute um, we started reading the tea leaves and uh, even before there was any announcement of government help, we decided to lay off um, six of our staff. Um, it was a hard decision to do, and, and especially at a time when you know that there aren't clinical jobs around. So for example, during a real estate crisis, if, if you lay off jobs, well, people can go get you know work somewhere else, but this pandemic put, you know, really presented a problem where you can't find other work. So it was really difficult. Um, however, you know, we're a full service agency, so our crisis management division has been nonstop busy. Companies are really under scrutiny right now for what they're doing with their PPP money, for, um, you know, for uh, social distancing violations and whatnot. So we've been really busy on the crisis side. Um, predicting years ago that social media would one day eclipse the PR side, the communication side of our business. Um, it's really starting to, to become true. Um, our social media division took off even greater. There were no cuts whatsoever, whereas we had some clients that asked us to take a reduced retainer, not social media. They've been working around the clock and really in a position to raise retainers because of the amount of work and dependency that our clients have had on the social media team. So between the crisis management and the social media, we've been busy. Of course, our experiential marketing division, which falls under our new brand Cultivate, that has you know, slowed down, but we won a very large contract um, with Rolls-Royce Corporate of North America and also De Beers. So um, you know, surprisingly, contracts are getting signed. People are still um, you know, thinking about the future, and, and, but the other events are on hold for the foreseeable future. Nick? You know, we have, um, we, we have our teams in Miami, New York, and Los Angeles. And, you know, in the hospitality division, we definitely saw a decline in that. But we've also seen that as the number one um, sector of our business to rebound um, quickest. We also have, we have fashion, beauty, hospitality, and art and design. A lot of our online fashion, they're doing tremendous numbers. Our spirits portfolio, 450% increase uh, in business across the board on many of the brands. Mm -hmm. And um, we are seeing, you know, our clients, you know, come to us, you know, not only for press, but really through guidance, managing potential crisis opportunities, such as Sissy was mentioning, with reopening in a very mindful, um, sensitive way. We landed really one of our largest hospitality clients, you know, um, the whole SBE portfolio during this um, um, quarantine. And, you know, how wonderful is it to be able to relaunch all these brands, whether it's hotels or mall-based retailers, um, all at the same time. I and mean, this is something we've never done. I've opened hotels, one here, one month, another hotel, but opening, you know, like up to 12 hotels in one month across the country is pretty amazing and, and really interesting, a great exercise. What have been some of the bigger challenges personally that you've had with managing this time and how have you been dealing with those challenges? Sissy? Personally, not having everyone in the office, you know, you lose that energy and collaboration. Although it was nice to see how quickly um, people converted their home offices to, you know, a full-time office. And there really wasn't a glitch. You just missed the cult, the business culture a little bit, but um, everybody really worked together well, really stepped up. Um, with less staff, it means we're doing more work, right? So I've, it's, in a way, it's been nice because I've gone back to some of the basics that I did in PR when I first started. I'm writing press releases again, and I'm pitching, and um, you know, it, less management and less rainmaking, but more um, of what I really loved about the PR business: communicating, helping clients come across well, um, you know, creating plans for the future. Um, it, it's been nice to kind of dig back into the roots of, of PR. Lauren. Um. I think that some of the, one of the biggest challenges was just kind of right off the bat, implementing a system that would keep the team motivated and positive with a healthy mentality and attitude towards work and focused 
to stay focused. Mm -hmm. So it's just about implementing different procedures that we had to adhere to every day, um, regular check-ins, and we maintain daily calls with all of our clients. Uh, in the beginning, I thought it was going to be really challenging, but it turned out to be not that bad, actually, to be honest. So, yeah, I'm proud of my team. Nick? You know, uh, Lauren and I were also friends and also were contemporaries in this industry. And so we would share when this was happening, she and I would talk all the way through this about managing our teams, our business, morale. And I think that was probably one of the most challenging is that you have this wonderful loyal team that has been with you for so long and they're just really scared. They're scared because there's a pandemic. They're scared they may lose their jobs um, and to maintain that they feel, you know, enrolled and excited in their jobs uh, while, of course, we have clients. Um, and then just maintaining that morale. I, I thought that was really challenging because as much as you know, we were talking about really directing and leading the business, it was really just also to put on um, more of an HR cap and really help guide them and calm them through this. How have you had to pivot the business to, in light of COVID, Nick, just to keep on where you are? You know, um, it's, creating a new message, maintaining it very sensitively um, because the people, everyone handle this, is handling this very differently. And we can't over promote something or over publicize something because then it becomes insensitive uh, in the eyes of the consumer and the media. Um, it's more about feelings. And my motto is there's no right or wrong with feelings. It's just really understanding each person's feelings. So it's really trying to navigate through that so that we can maintain that we are effective um, and then um, and then creating a new way to communicate. You know, we're not doing trunk shows at a store or product launches or, you know, tastings at a restaurant. We're doing Zoom tastings and we're doing Zoom trunk shows and conversations and panel talks, just like you've done, which, you know, I, I have to applaud Hot Living. You were really the first to to bring this type of messaging to the market, uh, which has been great. I mean, the first one that you did, uh, we watched, I've been literally watching all of them. And it's really helpful because my whole point is, you know, we are here to help our clients. And I believe like Lauren said before, you know, some of us have been with us for so long and we're helping them. Some are paying, some can't afford to pay, some are paying very little. And it's really to help get them through this. And, you know, and hopefully today's conversation helps other businesses see how they can navigate through a very odd, difficult time. I think we've all been through Zika, hurricanes, recessions, 9-11. So we've been through a lot, especially in Miami. But, um, you know, now this is something that's affected the whole world. Oh yeah, definitely, this is unprecedented. Um, Lauren, would you say that the definition of luxury has shifted during this time? Absolutely, I, I mean, starting in March, it's been shifting every day, um, all the time. There are huge unknowns, I mean, globally in all different industries and in all different sectors, but specifically to the fashion world, I mean, this has really disrupted the global economy like ways we've never seen before, at least in my generation. I was young in 2008 and I don't remember. So like, I would call Nick and be like, well, can you, can you send me your strategy for 2008? Cause I don't remember, you know, I was Carol Bell's assistant. So I've never really dealt with this. So in the beginning, I just picked up the phone and called all of our friends to see what they were doing, what tactics they were imploring. But I mean, for luxury, it's like the brands, especially, especially the global, global, global conglomerates like LVMH caring, they're really the ones leading the way. They haven't made any decisions yet. I mean, Gucci just announced that they're now doing two collections and two shows. Um, and they're hoping that the other brands will follow suit. And it really starts with the customer that they have to take into consideration first. And, you know, when discretionary income is constrained for the majority of the consumers, it tends to push people down the price ladder. ladder. But a lot of brands have been analyzing how China has been. So the first day Hermes was open in China in April, they did 2.7 in sales, mm -hmm. um, $2 million in sales. So 
Um, there's no right or wrong answer. It's people aren't necessarily, you can't create a six month strategy from now because it wouldn't be going to a second wave. So think you have to adapt everything. So if you have a billboard plan for a product launch that you can't push anytime soon, and that's $50,000 that's going up in September, you might need to place that somewhere else and focus more on digital. Um, not for luxury brands so much, but like text messaging. Like I've received tons of text messages from like, I don't know, athleisure websites. And that's really effective because it's a hundred percent open rate and it's a direct click through right to their, their, um, their website. So that method has been very, very effective. Um, for luxury brands, you'll see even on Instagram, the messages is not about pushing product. It's not about drops. It's not about luxury um, or expensive. It's really going back to their roots, um, back to craftsmanship. We'll see old campaigns and they're kind of shedding light on the history of the house and their DNA and the roots. Um, and even a lot of destinations in Miami are doing that. One of my clients, you know, we're not pushing luxury, we're pushing art and we're pushing, you know, beautiful attributes of that company or brand or that neighborhood. Um, you have to be very, very sensitive. One wrong move can really up upset a lot of people. You have to be, you have to be very compassionate, whether you're a global luxury brand leader or whether you're a small local business. So. Lauren, Lauren, don't you think too, like this is going to become like part of like the great divide where, you know, you're growing up, there was, there was just very limited luxury good companies, but now so much in the past 10 years have emerged and they're more mass luxury. And I think this is going to really bring back to true luxury, like you were mentioning, like the craftsmanship and the story and the heritage behind the brand. Right, right. And if you think about it for luxury brands, there's so many different categories. So you have men's, you have women's, you have leather goods, you have travel, you have beauty, you have high jewelry, you have fine jewelry, you have accessories. And actually, out of all categories right now, globally, accessories is doing the best. Um, where ready to wear is doing the worst and so is watches. But so what's interesting is I have a watch client and people are investing in watches, but it's limited edition watches, similar to art, right? So people are spending a lot of money on, on exclusive timepieces. So it's, 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 you have, it's, you, I spend all day reading and researching more than I am like, you know, responding to emails because I have to do that. I have to educate my clients on the daily shifts in the luxury market globally. Sissy, what, what about you? I think that luxury is always evolving. I mean, if you think back 30 years ago, they introduced the E-class to Mercedes, right? There was always the S-class, but they started introducing other, other lines. And so luxury just continues to evolve. I think right now it's under more scrutiny than ever. There's definitely a, 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 almost a, a class divide that's taking place. And uh, if brands make any missteps, they're going to be really um, called out and criticized. You know, sustainable is the new luxury and how brands are coming back to nature and, um, and health-wise. And, and all of that is resonating now more than ever than the actual purchase. I think the experiential marketing aspect of it is more important than ever because anyone can buy anything with, you know, a computer uh, in front of them and order something immediately, but they can't have that experience. So I think there are some companies that are really going to be positioned well in the future because of the pandemic. For example, 50% um, of all the new uh, jet cards that have been purchased are by first time users. So think about that for the private aviation business. Now for the first time, they're getting new customers that they would never have gotten. Why? People don't wanna go into those high touch turnstiles of, of, of an airport, even if it's first class, you're still you know, with a lot of other people and having to go through check through. Yachting has been on the upswing too, because people are realizing I want to be with my family. I want to be in a, a clean, healthy environment outside of the city. Um, we're hearing from jewelry companies that they're seeing people purchase jewelry because it's a um, celebration of life. There's this pent up demand and people have been under this austerity and isolation. Now they're going to come back and want to live and they're still going to go back to the heritage brands. 
they, I, I just, it's just evolving like it always does. How do you guys find that your clients are, now that, for example, Miami's reopening officially on the first, our hotels, beaches are opening, um, other cities are either a little bit ahead of us or behind us. How do you guys see the next, that reopening strategy for your clients? What's the messaging? The sooner the better. You know, if any of you have been to a restaurant yet, you, you realize it's a little awkward, but it, it's good to be out. It's good to see businesses back because none of us can survive. We're all part of one big ecosystem, right? So if the hotel industry creators, we're all going to be affected. If the cruise lines don't come back, if, if, I, I live not too far in Coral Gables from the airport and we drive through it on our way to Vero Beach. It's empty. That can't continue. So the more people get out and start working and get dressed and go to those restaurants, that fear is going to subside. We're not all going to die from COVID. The Washington Post has a great story. If you want to read it today about what a small percentage of the population really truly is affected. But the fear is so great. So we're all herd animals. We are social beings. We need to be with other people. So the sooner people feel comfortable going to restaurants, the sooner they'll feel comfortable going to Broadway, the sooner they'll feel comfortable going back to the Fort Lauderdale boat show and looking at yachts with other people, um, it'll, it'll all come back. And it, you know, Disney World announced their opening July 1st. That, that, that's, that's a big great. statement. It's a, it's a big statement. While it seems maybe premature, the fact is that's her business model and um, the show must go on. So I think the, the key is that restaurant opening and people feeling comfortable and confident again, that they're going to be okay. Yeah, it's, you know, we're in such a unique position, you know, in South Florida. Um, there's been so many wonderful stories about, you know, the New York Times had that story. What was the number one, uh, the number one address for New Yorkers being forwarded is to Miami. Uh, Travel and Leisure did the story about, you know, with Expedia, the number one was most Googled or searched destination is Miami. Uh, you know, the Northeast is not going to be habitable, especially in New York. Uh, it's going to be really hard, and it is hard to live there right now, that it's a big opportunity for our hotels, our restaurants, our retail, uh, also real estate. Our real estate clients are seeing tremendous numbers in rentals, now sales going up. Um, and I think if we really play it right, our city, uh, we, you know, we all say we're a year round city now, but we know it kind of gets quiet in the summer. But I do feel that, you know, we're going to have a lot of amazing people in Miami this summer, staying in beautiful homes, renting amazing yachts and staying in suites. Our hotels are, we're renting rooms month or two months at a time, you know, and suites and penthouses. It's a really interesting time. This is like, you know, nothing that Miami has seen. And, and I always feel like this city gets in it and gets out of it really quick. You know, our recession, the housing market, uh, it bounces back. There's, this is a magic city and, and things really do work well here for others. And I always tell people when they come here, I always say Miami is the land of golden opportunity. You can make something happen here. And it's harder to do in other parts of the country or the world. Um, and so I'm so happy that our hotels, our restaurants, our retail design district and Bell Harbor shops opened at Ventura now. It's great. I think um, I think it's important, you know, when you started reopening it, to just really keep the expectations low and remain humble and really clearly, if you're communicating about an opening from a PR standpoint, you know, throughout this entire time, readers want to hear not only what brands and companies are doing to protect their customers but also their employees. That was a big number one thing in every single case study and all of the news, you know, and that's the first time that brands and companies talk and educate, you know, readers about what they're doing for their employees and how they're protecting their employees and the measures that they're taking. So for one of our, I mean, for all of my clients, if we were communicating, some of my clients, you know, we thought it was in the best interest to kind of remain lay low and just focus on, um, you know, their origins, DNA, et cetera, as I talked about. But when we talk about reopening, it's just really making people feel comfortable to come when they're ready and here's why. Whether it's like the design district, we're designed to be open air and spacious. 
um, capacity for the neighborhood is humongous. So we don't face the challenge of being over 25 or 50 percent. And it's just kind of lightly and sensitively encouraging people, hey, we're open when you're ready, come by, we'll be happy to see you. And you'll be safe. Keywords. <laughs> and you'll be safe. In overall, how has this pandemic affected, made the biggest impact? How, what's the biggest impact it's made on your business right now? On my business? Um, I mean, events. Yeah. Events is a, a big part of our business. Um, you know, it's not as big of a focus as um, our PR communications divisions and marketing, but because we have other areas of specialties, we are able to offset the loss of our event revenue with, you know, digital social media um, advertising and obviously PR. So like I said earlier, we are so connected with our clients that we can step in and almost any division and help with the strategy implementation and execution. So I would just say more, more so events. Do you see the future going more into the virtual space? Are your clients making those requests now? Yeah, we've been seeing a lot of it. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, so many with virtual events, uh, whether it's through music, um, spirits, fashion, um, it's, you know, it's a new way to communicate to people and people like it. People feel really comfortable. Like, I love this, that I get to see everyone's faces um, right now. Um, and the brands like it too. And of course, like Lauren was saying, from a retail perspective, this is risk-free um, and you know it's a it's a big opportunity to further expand I think it's gonna be part of our new normal I definitely think that they're gonna complement each other for example with the uh, Fort Lauderdale boat show coming up, coming up in October we just went to the virtual model for the Palm Beach show so you know everyone very optimistic that we're going to have a regular show in, in Fort Lauderdale in its history you know this will go on but the virtual show will be a complement to it, right? So you'll have both. So I think that we're gonna see more of it, but I don't think it's gonna replace it because at the end of the day, the sales process, you know, when, when somebody goes into a boutique and they're met with, um, uh, you know, the, the salesperson who understands their needs and, uh, you know, knows the customer, knows what the customer wants and gives that white glove service, you can't, you can't do that online. So I think they're just going to complement each other and coexist. I mean, <sighs> My feelings change about this every day, I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> I think that, um, I think for the time being, and especially if we go into a second wave, we're gonna have to make the best out of virtual. And I think this is the safest option. And there's ways to be creative, right? Just exactly what Paul Living is doing. I'm a huge component of it. Um, and trying to support through my clients. And it's, it's funny, when, I love when I'm on calls with you know Europe and then Hull Living comes up and all the great things that you're doing and I'm like the biggest cheerleader. But um, like, you know, we just did uh, a launch uh, for one of our clients and a luxury brand that they partner with to unveil exclusive product. So what we did, we hosted a press preview via Zoom and we had to find a production team and the hosts were in three different countries and it was, it was great for us to learn how to do that. And we basically unveiled it, held a press preview, and we launched and debuted an augmented, augmented reality component for the first time. So you could actually see the watch on your wrist virtually, right? Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, I think in a year from now, people like to have that emotional interaction with luxury products, yeah. you know? Like it's estimated by next year, 30% of luxury goods will be sold online. Um, I, think that's, I think that's starting Q4 of this year, but a lot of the studies haven't really taken into consideration if we go into a second wave, but you know, even designers, they need, like they can't have a, a runway show virtually. 
you know, they can't fit models virtually. They can't design couture without fittings and a model and interactions and getting people's feedback. Like, you need that, that intimacy and, and, and being social. So while I think it's important that everyone's being safe and adapting to the change virtually, I think that by next year, we'll be ready to get back in the game. So you think it'll be a, we're a year out from normalcy? If we go into a second wave. Since you mentioned that, we have a question from one of our viewers for all of you. As all of you mentioned, COVID-19 is something never seen before. What are your lessons you have learned for the PR industry so far? Also, what are you doing to prepare for the second wave that could be as strong or even stronger than the first one? I think that it's important to be very, very delicate and sensitive when it comes to pitching. You know, some editors take offense to it, like for luxury, for example. It's like, how could you pitch luxury right now when it's such a delicate time? But writers still need to publish not, not everyone can, not all outlets can write about COVID-19, let's be honest, you know, so especially print, they still need luxuries. So instead of, you know, sending them a pitch, it's, hey, are you open to receiving a pitch about this? Um, you know, it's just, that's, it, it's just a different way to approach editors, even if they're your best friends. Uh, I just think it's really important to be sensitive and delicate about that. Maybe pick up the phone instead and say, hey, are you open you know, I'm not sure what's going on in the company right now. Are you open to covering this stuff? We just want to be sensitive and wanted to ask your opinion first. Like you really have to adapt the way you're pitching, for sure. Yeah, yeah. I would agree yeah. with that. Like, I was to, just gonna, if they're I was just... for content, right? So if you're able to provide that content and also show how luxury brands are doing good, it's a great opportunity to showcase all that luxury brands can do to help the community. We recently did a blood drive for Brayman uh, Motors, Brayman Bentley in Miami and BMW. Um, and it was great because they really can't have a lot of traffic in the showroom, right? But they, are, they still want to be relevant and out there. So by doing a blood drive that was by appointment, we could minimize the amount of people coming. We were able to engage with the customers. We were sensitive. And, you know, it's a way to, you know, give back to the community, do something good during this time when you can't sell. So there, there's opportunities to be, you know, sensitive and pitch and keep your clients out. And there's no greater way now than to encourage clients to take that sort of social corporate responsibility to a new level. It's, it's a great opportunity for now for, for companies that haven't stepped up to start stepping up. And those that do and have a long track history of, of giving back to, to, to proudly and gently, um, not trumpet that, but, you know, communicate that because consumers want to know, to your point about how, how employees are being taken care of, they also want to know about what you're doing for the community at this time. Yeah, and I think, you know, to Violet, to answer the second part of your question, you know, is I think the biggest key is to anticipate and to anticipate if there's a second wave, which most likely there will be, particularly in parts of the country, maybe not so much for Miami, but with our, uh, with our, administration that we have right now, they're not looking to close again. Of course, I think it's gonna come case by case depending on your client and what they feel their social responsibility is. And so those are conversations that we're having now with our clients to take a look at you know, our long lead initiatives, what we're doing. You know, Impress, we have short lead and long lead pitches. Same thing with planning and anticipating this because in October, November, which is just you know four or five months away from now, uh, it could be a very different opportunity. And it's gonna help, it's going to affect our clients dramatically, depending if say New York, if it closes down again, or if they ban travel, air travel, but yet while businesses may still be open. So we're giving them all these different scenarios that we're running through. Mm -hmm. So this time we go into it, not with basically, man, we had the president speak in one day, and then with probably five days, we were just all about shutting down. Mm -hmm. um, and, and there was a lot of fear in that. So I think if you anticipate properly, you can minimize the fear and really um, outweigh the risk. Mm -hmm. Do you think Miami is at an advantage? Or huge advantage, huge advantage. I think, you know, it's, um, 
for a lot of reasons. I mean, A, it's just, you know, the spot where people want to be. Uh, we have so many wide open spaces. Our population's not as dense as other parts of the country, particularly large um, metropolis cities. Um, it's, you know, the humidity and the temperature has shown it does do better to, you know, to kill the virus. Um, and, um, you know, with this new normal, with what we're doing now, Zoom conference calls, um, you know, whether you're working for Morgan Stanley, a luxury good or a hospitality brand, you're able to do, you're able to conduct your business with your clients over the phone. So I think that we have an opportunity to really help this city expand even further, you know, post this um, quarantine pandemic. I, I think like I, I agree with you, Nick. I think that it's both those. So, you know, I think the good thing is that, you know, typically half of the people who don't have regular jobs like we do, the minute their kids are out of school, they're gone for the whole summer, whether they're in Europe or Hamptons or Aspen, whatever it may be. I think you're gonna see a lot more people stay in Miami this year and not clear out. Um, but at the end of the day, Miami relies on tourism. A lot of it for all of our annual events that happen throughout the entire course of the year, half of which already had to be canceled. And God forbid, if we go in the second wave, you know, my concern is gonna really affect not having our tourism is gonna affect Miami. So I think it's important for all of us in our industry to come together and work with government officials and work with the GMCVB and really target local um, local consumers and, and people who live here and people who aren't traveling or who can't travel to Europe this year. I mean, half of Miami clears out, you know, in, even in July during swim week. Um, and so that's challenging, but I think they're going to be here a lot, but you know, it's like for Nick and I, it's like we all work together. It's important for us to support our, our media outlets here because some of them are being really hurt and, you know, they're our bread and butter too. So, I don't know. It's just, it's kind of coming together and identifying what the best strategy is and working together as a team to support our economy if we're not going to have tourism. And I think that, Lauren, we are going to have it. Um, it's, you know, it's interesting, you know, since we have such a big hospitality division, you know, we're focusing now, particularly say for summer, on, of course, statewide travel, that three hour drive. Right. Um, the, you know, right now there are values in travel. Um, it's not a luxury um, person, except for like the suites, the long-term stays. Um, but, you know, the value proposition is sometime outweighing the risk, which is good. Um, so you're not feeling as guilty of, you know, driving, flying. Um, I do hope that, you know, this second wave, hopefully it, it doesn't affect the travel because we do want the European and the Central and South American right. travel. I mean, we, you know, we're also used to that wonderful Brazilian culture that comes in July 1st for those wonderful five weeks in July. And they just kind of buy up the whole town and they shop and they go out, you know, and we're not they're possibly, most likely not gonna have that this year. And so what we're trying to focus on is where is the, where is it coming from? And with GMCBB with their Miami Shine program, was also launching Miami Spice now um, from June 1st all the way to September 30th. Uh, it's big It's big because it shows people from all over the country, let's go to Miami, let's stay, let's stay in the US, let's take our luxury yacht charter from Miami, stay within the Miami area. Um, so we, we just gotta work it a little differently than we typically have. I think Miami is supposed to truly um rival New York in terms of all industries. Um, it's such a young city. Um, I can remember years ago going to meet with editors in New York when the JW Marriott Marquis was opening in downtown Miami. And I was talking about our new uh, performing arts center that was going to be built. And the media looked at me like I was crazy. Why would anybody from New York go to Miami for culture? Well, since that time, we've become the art capital of the world practically with our you know, exciting art week that happens and our performing art centers and, and the city has changed so much. So now we have that culture that we didn't have. We didn't have the world-class restaurants that we have now, if you look back 15 years ago. So all of these things and the no state income tax 
and 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 a welcome environment for diversity from people from all over the world. We're you know one of the most international cities on the planet. We are just poised to really benefit from this because we have world class healthcare. So people from South America are, are coming and thinking, you know, I'm going to park my money in Miami, not just because of political unrest, but because it's a healthy place and there's great education there. So all of these things are aligning to really move Miami um, to a, a degree and a level I think it's never seen before. We're really going to benefit. We, we don't have that public transportation, which is half the problem in these cities like Hong Kong, like Tokyo, like Paris. You know, they rely on the, the subways and the metros. We don't have that. We're a car city. So we benefit from not having that mass public transportation and that high density. Our streets and city, city is clean. Our sidewalks are clean. You're not stepping over trash. You know, I love New York. I have an apartment there. We have our office there. But I think that the value proposition in Miami has never been more. And I think that our city is going to be poised for dramatic growth. We're already seeing it in the real estate. They're, they're coming. Um, it's, it's our moment. We're going to come through with this. Our um, death rate is very low compared to the rest of the country. I think Miami has got the message. And I really uh, credit our mayor for doing his regular broadcast, talking about you know, that he had it and uh, urging people to stay home. And He's great. I think I, yeah, I think he did a really great job of, of getting people aware. And I also think young people have been really smart. I mean, I know they got criticized for all the parties in the beginning for spring break. <laughs> But I know so many young people that told their parents, don't go out, don't go to dinner with another couple, don't have yeah. people over to our house, right? You're laughing because you have a ninth grader, right? So you know, Vicki and Violet rather, you know that that's, you know, people, the, the young people are getting it. And I'm not fearful of a second wave. I believe we will have a vaccine. I believe we'll have learned from the lessons um, of this pandemic. We, we, it came upon us like lightning. We've never seen anything like this. But if you lived in China or Tokyo, you're, you've experienced this before with SARS. And, and, and in Europe, they, they, they experienced some uh, you know, issues with Ebola. They're a little bit better prepared. And that's why they came out of it in, in China quicker. I think we'll be better prepared if it should come. But, but I don't think it's a given. Yes, will there be other you know, corona-related viruses? Certainly. And it, we're in a new world. And, you know, but... You know, I don't, I don't, I don't have necessarily think it's right around the second wave when we're going to be crushed. I think, in some ways, the the, the national media um, has has played it up to a point that it's really fear mongered, much like they do when the hurricane's coming. You know, everybody, hurricane category six, run for the cover, run for the hills. And then it passes us, and so I think we have to measure that. I'm optimistic that we don't get it. You mentioned Lauren later on in the after, in in the year we have one of our biggest events, um, our Basel. Mm -hmm. In Switzerland, it's been postponed. It's September. Now, it's September, correct? Have you started having the conversations about our Basel with the clients that you activate with every year? Um, some of our clients, yeah, clients who are here. Uh, with our luxury brand clients, um, some of them, I think like when we're, when we're adjusting our strategies, right, it's being adjusted every month and the next three months are already solidified. But for the year end, Q3 and Q4, we have a plan A and a plan B. And so we'll access that in September, basically. Um, but it just really depends. I think we'll definitely be ready prepared if Basel happens here. But if there's are a lot of restrictions with having to quarantine when you come to different countries, I think that might be a problem. Um, and also, there's beautiful people here that come for Art Basel from all around the world, right? And the Europeans, and it's my favorite time of year of Miami because the energy, the vibe, the people. I mean, I love it. It's, it's, my, it's, it's my favorite time of year. It's my, even though I don't see anything except art when it's being taken off of a truck, um, it's my favorite time of year. And the people are what make it really special. So um, do I think that 
Dior is going to spend millions and millions of dollars this year doing a show at the Rebel Gallery and flying people in private. I, we'll see, you know, we'll, we'll see. I don't think we can properly, properly plan yet. I think those conversations will happen in, you know, July before Europe breaks for holiday or right after in August and, and, and end of August. So we'll see. Like I said, plan A, plan B. I agree, Lauren. It's just the same thing on our end. It's that we're hoping for it, we're planning for it. Um, we hope it stays on track. Um, we are talking about it with our clients, the ones who come back every year and the ones who also um, really rely on it. Um, but, you know, we'll, we, we're looking to create another initiatives around that time of the year in case it doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. And it's just reinvention, you know, at, at the end of the day, everything happens for a reason. So instead of fighting it, you just a break. I mean, like I said, I do not like change, but I, for the first time in my life, I'm embracing it. And I know at the end of the day, we'll all come out better, more educated, and it's happening for a reason. We'll all figure it out together. If I don't know something, I'll pick up the phone and call Nick and be like, what's your strategy for this? Because I need, you know feedback and that's a lot that's that's what we've been doing too because i'm younger i've never done this so for me when i don't know the answer to something i don't, i pick up the phone and call somebody in our industry and say i'm stuck on this what do you think about this what do you think about that and that's really helped me a lot through this entire thing um and even with my clients too um who rely on me to guide them the right way so i think sharing knowledge and supporting each other is one of the most important things and when in regards to Basel, it will happen and it will be bigger and better with different platforms and different, um, I don't know, strategies and activations and more, you know, innovative digital, you know, properties and assets that we haven't seen before. So um, it'll be, it'll be good. We'll be okay. I think we'll see an art week, but I think it'll be very different. I think it's going to be much smaller. Everything would be, so for example, if Basel doesn't come, then there might be various galleries that host events and you know, intimate dinners where people feel comfortable with the amount of people there. So I think the spirit of art week will be there one way or another, but it might be, it might be very different in terms of, you know, large I, I don't know. I think by that time, people are just, it will be enough time that passes where people are over the, the fear of getting COVID and just accept that if it happens, it happens. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I don't know if we're going to have an art Basel and we're only going to be allowed to have events with 15 people. I'm not sure that's going to be the case, but, you know, I think there'll be definitely safety procedures that are implemented, but I, I think that Everyone will make the best out of it. And as a community, global community, especially for our Basel, we'll all come together and make the right decisions and, and we'll make it happen with different forms of reinventive you know, mm -hmm. tactics. Mm -hmm. One of our viewers has posed a question. Which of the new protocols and COVID trends do you think will stick around and in what ways is this a good thing? For example, QR codes at restaurants so you can access menu on your phone, virtual experiences, webinar. Masks are an accessory. Are they here to stay? More people will work from home. Which of these COVID trends do you guys think will stay? I hope the mask goes away. <laughs> By the end of the <laughs> no, me too. It's so difficult it's to talk. It kills me. Uh, it kills, especially when you have makeup on. Forget it, you know? <laughs> yeah. The, 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 the codes on the menu, those are great. I use them already. Um, I can't see that well, so I have to wear glasses. So I can actually read and you can zoom in and they're brighter. So it's really helpful. I like that. I didn't I know say, that, Nick. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm old. I look good on <laughs> oh, the outside, please. but the inside, <laughs> it's all brimstone and ash. Wait, Devon, she just says, I like wearing the mask. She's just waiting for the LV to start making them. I'll get you one, girl. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, they become quite the fashion accessory. But do you guys think any of the other trends are going to remain more people working from home? A balance? I think, yeah, for sure. I mean, like Google, for example, a lot of the tech companies in San Francisco, they're not going back till next year. Um, and so if, you know, if you have a team that works well at home and, and it's, and they're responsible and they're resourceful. And, you know, some people like 
to be in a team, some people can work efficiently from home. You know, my team has been surprisingly amazing and super supportive and we have timesheets they fill out. We check in at nine, we check in at the end of the day. Um, and before I was like, we had to be in the office. I'm there at nine o'clock. I'm the last one to leave. But, you know, I want them to feel safe. I want them to feel comfortable. I don't want to have a, a what, what, what I'm doing is assessing two to three weeks after Miami opens. And then I'm going to make a decision from there whether we're going to go back full time. But regardless, I'm going to ease them back into the office. Like I'm not going to make them go for the first time, you know, eight, nine hours a day, five days a week. That's, I don't want to do that. Like that's a, it's a very disruptive. So we'll ease back into it. And then we'll, I let, I'm, I'm, I'm a smaller team. I mean, you know, I don't have 20 employees. I don't have 30 clients. I don't, I don't want, I don't want that. I'm, I'm structured a little differently. So we kind of make decisions as a team. I, I have like, I rely on them and, and you know, if they don't feel comfortable going to the office right away, we'll work from home. It is what it is. I'd rather them feel safe and comforted and not spend half the day panicking and focusing on work, you know? So when they're comfortable and ready to go back, we'll go back. I was telling Lauren, um, we talked a couple of days ago, we're trying it on Monday to go back. Um, and she gave me great advice. And I like the idea of kind of easing back into it because even for myself, it's just like, I've been going for the past two weeks um, just to get it situated, move the desks around. You know, we have been in the same office for 19 years and has a lot of private office space, which we hated for so long. Now it's actually great that there's private office <laughs> spaces. <laughs> yes, like everything is history. Back in vogue. Right. Back in style, right. right. So, um, so we're gonna, you know, we're gonna try it out. And I, I like what Lauren said. We're gonna give it two weeks, see if we feel safe and comfortable. I now can work from home. I got my little computer. You know, Tara and I fight over it all the time. But other than that, um, you know, maybe I'll get another one. <laughs> I'll spring for it. Uh, our offices are in the design district, and um, you know, obviously, design district is one of my clients, and. I really miss them because they're family. So like I, I miss, I, I, I talk to our, my, my team, we talk all the time every day, but I miss seeing them. Like I miss my neighborhood. I miss walking around. I miss, like I miss that. that. Yeah. Lauren froze out a little. Yeah, she's a little frozen. Yeah, we got frozen, I think. Tensor rather later, but I think I'm going to eat back into it. Well, Am I frozen? You're back. No, you're, back. <laughs> you're back. I think a lot of them are here to stay. A lot. I think like if you go to Asia, they wear masks all the time. It's considered polite, right? If they have something wrong with them, they're not going to go out and sneeze on somebody. So masks might go away a little bit, but we might see more of them. It might be a little more common. And I agree, the, the cure... QR codes or whatever on the phones are great. Our menus are great. Nobody wants to touch anything anymore. So a lot of those trends are here to stay. I know for us, we now have uh, not required anybody to come into the office on Fridays anymore. Everybody can work from home. That also helps mitigate some of the stress of our crazy business. As you all know, agency life. I like in Palm Beach, I went a couple of weeks ago and I went to every single restaurant for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And in front of you, they ripped, I mean, they took full advantage of, you know me, and they ripped the menus up in front of you. And I actually, I thought that was really great and it made me feel at ease. So I've been to a couple of restaurants in Miami and I gave them that advice and they were like, good idea. So they started doing it. So people don't want the same paper menu that somebody else had. Right, yeah. yeah. So, and also, I don't want to wear a mask in a restaurant. It defeats the whole purpose of going. Yeah. But I want the staff to. Yeah, well, so. I think in Miami, once you sit, you can take the mask off, which, of course, mm -hmm. makes sense. But the staff, well, we've been to a few already, and they kept gloves on and masks. And, yeah, yeah I felt really safe. I felt really Me too. good. Me too. But like, for example, the thermal temperature taking at the airport, if you're about to get on a flight to London, I sort of like the idea of everybody having their you know, temperature check, you know? So, so I think some of these things could be really valuable. I mean, all of us have probably gotten caught something on an airplane before. So to yeah. know that there's that extra pre-screening that will give you, know, you some confidence that you can get on a plane and 
a lot of these countries are talking about these health passports where they, you know, you'll have it, uh, you know, passport saying you have an immunity to COVID, you can travel. So all of these, these might be the way of the future and they might be beneficial to us in the long run. I wish flying private was easier, but you know. Yeah, Wheels Up must be doing amazing right now. I actually, I actually, I'm, I grew up in Pennsylvania and I flew here to spend time with my mom and my sister a couple of days ago and I took a 6 a.m. flight because I wanted to make sure it was a clean on American and I had to take a connecting and the entire plane was packed, both planes. Wow. From Miami to Philly, Philly to Pittsburgh, but everyone had a mask on. It was really clean um, and I felt safe on the plane. I mean, I was in full-fledged camo gear, ready to go in the front lines with, you know, two N95 mask on, like the whole nine yards, you know what I mean? Like, like I was going to rob somebody, but I felt super safe. Well, we're coming to a close and I just want to ask you guys a few questions, um, closing questions, closing remarks. Um, what do you think is your biggest takeaway of this time? And what have you learned about yourselves individually during this time? I learned that, oh, Nick, you can start. I don't want to start. Yeah, you go. <laughs> you, go, you, go you, you go first. Ladies first. Um, listen, I, I'm always, you know, how I am in real life is, is basically in my morals and my ethics is how I am in my, in my company and with my team and with my clients. I, I, I am who I am. I don't change personalities when I'm walking into a room. And, and for me, like remaining humble is the most important thing. And that's something that I've just always you know, believed in and learned from my, a, a, a young age. And I don't think that PR, like all PR is good PR. You know, I think that there's a lot of my clients that did the right thing by just laying low and not really heavily communicating. And also where I come from, like corporate social responsibility is not something that is done for global conglomerates for uh, press purposes. It's done genuinely from their own goodwill and it's not supposed to be publicized anywhere. So, you know, it was nice to be able to educate and teach some of my clients that, whether it was a hospitality um, client or whether it was, um, you know, a beauty client, et cetera. So it was nice to share those things that I learned from working with luxury brands. But, you know, and I think that like, I've always been a big firm believer in supporting our local economy and our local, local, local business owners, even with vendors. If one of my clients want to hire someone from New York, I'm like, we're not doing that. We're hiring somebody from Miami. If they can do, like, it's just important to me to keep it at home and support local. And I've always been like that. And also encouraging other people to do that. And my takeaway is, is that, you know, without the help of my other colleagues in our industry, I wouldn't be where I am today. So anything I can do to give back and like support our media outlets that's like what's really the most important to me and educating my team and my clients that that's important too. We need to stick together and we need to continue building Miami up. So yeah, yeah. I think it's about, you know, for us similar, um, it's, you know, as we always have, but ever so more now is to value a dollar and an opportunity, not just for ourselves as our business, but for the clients we represent, because there's so many mouths that are being, uh, that require that revenue you know, to be fed with. Um, and just to be as authentic as possible, especially doing something so trying, so being very, very honest, um, very forthcoming, um, because you're managing and guiding these businesses and these clients so they can maintain profitability, they can keep their staffs hired, uh, which means that we can, which we've been fortunate to add a few jobs during this, which we're very proud of, but want to be able to continue to do that. And the authenticity is, is key during this time. And I think going back to what we were mentioning a little bit, this is going to be the great divide too. It's, you know, it's, you know, it's going to get rid of some of the, 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 the bad stuff or people or whatever it may be that are, that are out there and all the good will rise to the top. Yeah. Mark Cuban said it best. He said that this moment in time is going to define you or your brand. 
So I think that there's a lot, a lot of thought to go with that. Um, for me personally, it's been a time of gratitude. When you realize how much you have, you start, you stop looking at, at the jets and say, oh, I wish I had that private jet or I wish I had the bigger yacht. You realize how lucky you are to be able to go into the grocery store and maybe not have to look at your bill, right? When you know there's so many people, even in a community here like Royal Gables, who are standing in food lines at you know three o'clock in the afternoon, a you know, hundred deep. So I think it's been a, an opportunity, to really, kind of take inventory of what you have and how grateful you are, your blessings to be healthy, that your loved ones are healthy. That's what it's come down to for me. And also, I think my shaman said something to me in early February and. And after he told me that, I stopped panicking. But he said to me, there are other energetic things going on worldwide to the human consciousness. And if clients decide to halt services or leave, just let it be. Don't wish any other way. Accept it. This is a much bigger than any one industry. And this has never happened before worldwide. And it's rewiring the human race. And when this is over, everyone will be a better person because of that. And once he told me that, I was like, we're cool. We'll figure it out. Yeah, There's no obstacle great. that we can't face. So that really helped me not freak out anymore. That helped me. That was great. I told you that, right? Yeah, I love it. Yeah. Do you guys have any last words? That was mine. Sorry, I preempted the question. We love you, Hot Living. Thank you so much for giving us this forum. And Thank you, Violet. Thank you, you, April. I love you guys. And we're so proud of you. You guys are cool. killing it. Thank yeah. you, Sissy. To the thank pinnacle of the luxury lifestyle. No, really, thank you guys for joining us. It meant a lot. You guys mean a lot to us. So it was a real pleasure to have you on today. I'm really proud of you guys. Yeah. <laughs> really proud of you guys. You guys are taking it to the next level, and it's really been nice to see how well you've been doing with all of this. It's, it's admirable, and I'm proud of you guys. Thank you. Well, guys, you thank have you for having us. Thank you. Thank you. Have a wonderful weekend. Thank you, too. Share your social media for our viewers, please. What did yes. you say? You want to share your social media for our viewers, those that want to follow what you guys are doing, your company sites, your social. All right. It's one nine hundred nine seven six. I'm just kidding. <laughs> what, what, what do you want us to put that? No, no, just say it. Say where uh, we review it. Uh, Nazo Group. Silent G N A Double Z O Group is our handle, and mine's my name, Laura Nazo. Yeah, I think we're Tara Inc. T A R A I N K P R on Instagram, and then Tara Inc. dot com. At Cups PR. Thank you again so much. Have Thanks. a wonderful weekend, and I hope to see you guys soon in person. Thank you. Cheers to that. Bye. Okay.